Okay, now it's starting again. Okay. Yep. The live stream. Sorry about this, guys. So um, day four, we'll deal with uh, hardware cutting techniques today. Uh, you can find, well, as usual, uh, the description, the assignment, the template, and you you have some files that you can download. Um, usually I start with a simple demo, but uh, we'll see because you, you guys are already uh, more advanced with Grasshopper, so we might, we might go directly to... Sorry, I didn't hear myself on YouTube. Okay, now it's all set finally, all the technical stuff. So that's stuff for you to download and we'll see, we'll do that uh, later after the guest lecture. Meanwhile, I'm introducing, I'm introducing the process. Here we are. So that's the assignment for day four, hot wire cutting. Um, we'll use, so this, uh, you're learning guys a range of end factors that we can uh, that we can apply, we can install on the robot to customize the production. Of course, as usual, feel free to drop comments or interrupt me. Just let's have a conversation about this. First slide, I'm going straight to the point. What you guys are doing, you will produce a script. This script uh, will be processed by the Build Lab uh, at Coed, and we will make scale models from for you. One scale model each person, starting from a foam cube. So it's gonna be about programming cut planes in which that you will use to address the hot wire uh, to cut a foam cube. We'll see how to do that. Uh, I think that with your skills, it will be pretty simple uh, to, to figure out the orientation of the planes and to, to address the end effector. And, and that's it. And we will document uh, at the end uh, the, the, the model for you. We'll, uh, I really would like you to think about different approaches. And here you are seeing, actually through the slides, you will see some examples uh, that were developed from, but by students uh, in mainly this past spring. And so the students had the base file and they worked within that range of design opportunities. And, um, and that the, you can say, you can see some, of, uh, some examples of this, but I would like to, to give you even more freedom uh, to achieve uh, a, a final form. We talk about this. Just a couple of references, starting from art and then going slightly to architecture and digital fabrication and then coming back to our work in academia. Uh, I'm sharing some uh, inspirations uh, from this time uh, from uh, um, Vera Molnar. I mentioned her work yesterday, a uh, pioneer of digital art and obsessed with, you know, base geometries. Uh, in this case, this um, the one, one base element, the square analyzed, overanalyzed obsessively and try to understand, you know, the properties and to express that notion through repetition, through iterations, through you know, like obsessive tasks over and over, right? And that was that was actually like the way we framed the assignment this past spring in terms of we really want you to think about and actually the students worked in groups to populate, a, uh, to, to create a population of forms. So to us, the intention was like for them to think about like obsessively to this base cube, to this foam element and, and to imagine different ways uh, to work on the matter, on the material. Uh, another example, another reference, so LeWitt uh, Open Cubes, wonderful installation that uh, sort of there are some similarities, at least it's how I'm seeing these two do, do these projects uh, um, sort of combined together uh, to to work on the shape of a cube. So we are working three dimensionally now, and to have it's, it's interesting to have you know like some elements, some uh, guides that will give you hints of like this shape, the the, the, the initial study shape of the cube, 
right? So you have these incomplete cubes. They are not cubes at the end, right? But like if you look at them, you are imagining them as completed forms. And as we were mentioning before, right? Like having the imagination on seeing the material over your uh, digital files, digital uh, simulations in here is kind of like um, same approach, but with our eyes trying to close to conclude a form. Um, so just shifting this framework into the design uh, realm, design context, context. Uh, just to, to imagine uh, in a, just a way to destructure a cube and to imagine uh, what are the elements that we can create, even just developing a concept. So like we keep talking about uh, proto-architectural models, early stage ideas, early stage phase, 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 phases of design. And so really there's a certain richness that can be achieved within a simple form, uh, starting from like try to imagine negative, let's say built or positive and negative spaces. What's, what, what's, what is the envelope? What's the, the inner? Uh, volume and now we can create a relationship between them also imagining like really the surfaces that create a boundary between inside and outside and envelope uh, inner space and negative space so imagine just imagine this try to, to translate the references to the uh, to, to, to the, the design process and I this slide a few seconds ago, really, after seeing your submissions, because I noticed that many of you uh, using the subtractive process that Misery uh, explained yesterday, I think many of you developed this idea of site or topography or, you know, like uh, location, possibly, of uh, an architectural form. And I really was imagining that you guys could, uh, could think more about that and could develop even uh, a hot, uh, uh, hot, wire, um, hot wire cutting process to, uh, to implement Oops. an idea of topography as well. That's absolutely um, something that is welcome. Um, I don't know why I'm not loading these images. Let me try again. Needed to be loaded. Let's try again. And yeah, so that's really this was inspired by you. A uh, reference that you can find in Rob Art 2018 uh, conference, a series of workshops. And just, you know, to remain in this mindset of creating one unit and assemble it with other elements to scale up. Uh, the process, uh, here's a reference from Matter Design Studio. Uh, Ms. We mentioned this yesterday as well, another project from them. Uh, they really, their work really is really into digital fabrication and exploration of tools and robotics and uh, in general customization in digital fabrication. And as you can see, production of a large scale, I would say, uh, foam tower. But what's interesting also to me is, is this diagram because it shows how the production tools can really make us think of different ways to assemble, to build things, right? Like if we look at the brick, the brick is based on our hand and it, it is based on the fact, and we have seen this studied with Gilbert's experiments, uh, it's based on the, the repetitive task of picking up a brick and lay it to build something. So in this case, when we use digital fabrication, these relationships are not obvious anymore. So not necessarily, you know, we need our hand to be like the tool to implement something, but it really could be something else. And also the construction elements could, could have different sizes, different ways. We can really, really have a different, different range of opportunities uh, oh, 
You just started yes, this music? I did because awesome. after seeing uh, a few of the renders, I was also really motivated to sort of uh, add another level of complexity since our participants are more than equipped to be dealing with different materials or at least projecting different workflows. This project is actually from uh, uh, Harvard uh, GSD, where I think the students at the time were trying to sort of project this idea of uh, the typical production of ceramic tiles. So this isn't hot wire cutting per se, because the wire isn't sort of uh, heated to actually cut foam, but instead it's just a wire that cuts uh, clay along uh, a rural surface. Uh, so what you see on the left is traditionally the way bricks are made or, or like ceramics are used uh, is that they're like huge extruders. So what you see at point two is a simple conveyor belt that uh, lets you extrude just a simple rectangle of clay. But when you get to the robots at number three and five, they're really leveraging the fact that the robot can do a lot of cuts, uh, firstly, super precisely and also at a repetitive uh, level. So I guess in a lot of ways, these are also good provocations to talk about uh, materials uh, which have been around for thousands of years and sort of um, looking at workflows that could not only leverage the fact that we have highly skilled craftsmen, but how can we sort of work closely with them, also with the social context to sort of keep that art of uh, ceramics and brick making alive, but also look at it through a digital rent, uh, uh, through a th digital uh, lens. So the next image also sort of shows how they're uh, really using the same concepts we'll be learning today uh, and, and challenges this notion of uh, ruled geometries. So I, I guess at this point, just feel free to explore a few of these, or we could also sort of take these projects up uh, tomorrow when we start to customize workflows. But uh, yeah, I, I hope these are giving some provocations to put it in a larger context as well. Yeah, and also this notion of workflows, right? Like that are completely customized. You have control over the process. And in here, just, um, just to reconverge these uh, these ideas, uh, these works that we have been looking into, into um, this is what we are implementing for you guys. So you're seeing Bianco, the robot in the build lab, uh, going through the process of how to wire cutting. These are examples from like students' work from this past semester, but also a couple of years ago. Uh, in which they really were trying uh, to work subtractively uh, to create um, an architectural concept. In some instances, we developed through digital fabrication, more like the, the developed in height uh, forms, uh, and then we call them like the digital fabricated or folded tower. In this case, uh, we call them like hot wire cut or folded cubes, but like you have a sense of what was our concept. But again, as Ms. Re mentioned, like try to push it and to imagine your own um, creative process, creative workflow. Um, and in here more, and, and actually the uh, the files that we have shared with you uh, are like based on this idea. Uh, so you'll, you, you can test it, you can simulate that, you, you can look into that, but then you can, you can shift and you can just uh, take a different direction. But in here, and uh, again, back to that notion of workflow, you can see how like the, the overall uh, stream, right? Like from the design, form definition, simulation to test that everything is right, that everything works fine, there are not collisions, and then finally the implementation. Uh, we'll talk about this later. Uh, this time you guys are working on the matter for real. Uh, so we need to be extra careful uh, in the definition of the script because we really want the process to run smoothly. We don't want self collisions. We have a fairly, I'm coming back here, big end effector. 
So it means that all these rotations need to be controlled 100% before uh, we process anything. And, and hopefully you won't be able to touch the foam queue, but hopefully this will give you, let's say like 90% of agency over, <laughs> right? Like understanding of the overall process. And just to share uh, another approach, you can even think of like working inside the material that's totally feasible. And, and actually like, if you like are starting to connect now these notions that you have, that you're acquiring these days, uh, you know, this notion of toolpath and then the factor, now you can imagine this be basically being a line, right? So it's not anything complicated and you can even work like with two perpendicular sections in which you create one toolpath that goes, let's say from point zero, get into the cube, and uh, maybe maybe this this was a cut plane as well. I remember this being uh, just a cube, a foam cube, and then you can enter the material, uh, make a tour, <laughs> come back, and then cut it uh, perpendicularly with another section that is just a polyline, basically. And then in here, you can imagine this as an architectural uh, idea uh, by uh, ju just stating what what's your idea of scale of dimension of this element. Uh, this, this was the inspiration actually uh, from Shiro Studio uh, based in London, uh, sort of like industrial design and architecture. When these things are combined, these are the results, stunning. <laughs> uh, something that if you if you look like specifically at the geometry, you will realize I'm mean, going back to this notion of limitations, like what we can or we cannot do with a tool. You might realize that this is not or hard, hardly feasible with the whole wire cutting process because you can see some doubly curved surfaces. While instead, you need to imagine that we will implement something like really using a line basically, right? That is not curved. That's also a really great geometric uh, sort of challenge because this yesterday I was going through a few of Gaudi's drawings and again, it just baffles me how he managed to make his geometries look so organic, but in reality, they're all ruled surfaces. So there's also right. that uh, twist of what looks organic and well, not doubly curved, but at least resembles curves, but it's actually made with a straight line. Of course, with, with the end effector and the wire cutter frame, we have to be super mindful of not having collisions and watching the script super closely, but it's also a good challenge to push ourselves uh, in that realm of geometry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, okay, let's go to the task. So we're asking you uh, to create a model, starting from a foam cube. So this time is a moment in which like, we are jumping out of the digital world and dealing with a materiality. And we will use the robot to hotwire cut a foam cube. Uh, and hopefully you will imagine that as a scale model, as an architectural form, or as uh, creative design exploration. Um, and, and even later, I think we'll, we'll share more, more examples just to boost your creativity and to challenge you, uh, in, in this. So as usual, the deliverables, uh, show us a bit of the digital process and could really be a line, right? Like just cutting through and, and, and defining that toolpath and showing the animation uh, of the, the robot going, going through that that path and like touching those target points. And this time, yeah, again, uh, give us uh, Rhino Grasshopper and the export the scripts uh, so that we can do a first pass and, and check if there are any, you know, mistakes or collisions that we need to fix as like a first pass before handling the files to the build lab. Uh, so I know that you guys, you know, like let's say submit before the next session, but if you if you try to submit this as soon as possible, simply we have just more time, you know, like to, to process to process data. 
and and hopefully this will get you excited about the possibility that that in like in from many many countries in the world you will be able to create something in michigan <laughs> like a real object remotely so i think it's exciting and and i'm showing more uh, more examples uh here are some some outcomes from 2019 uh, i mixed a bit the two classes actually so again you you won't see um sort of like a, a different design thinking through the example that i'm showing uh, because the the class was way wider and so we, we had like a week to implement this we really wanted the, the students to focus on like learning uh learning the process uh we're, while we're also going through this, Sarah, we have a question from the students asking about the size of the cube, if we have those dimensions available from the built lab. Didn't I write this here? Is, six, is it six by six by six inches, Emily? Or eight? I don't, never remember. I think it's six by six. I was going to say, I can't remember either, but I think it um, was it in the file, the cube? In the yeah, in the file, it's in the right, yeah. It's on the run of file. So Spartaco, can you confirm? Is that six inches? Ah, should be the file is in millimeters though. It's about uh, 10 centimeters, should be. Okay, let me check. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think it's about, is it uh, centimeters? Yeah, I mean, it's, well, that, that should be. 52, yes, six by six by six. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I forgot to, to put it here. Uh, that's the dimension. So it's a little object and that's for the sake of, you know, optimizing the implementation because like having, like if, if we have to process like 16 or 18 files might take a while. So just to make the process faster and easier and cheaper, uh, that's, that's the choice that led to, uh, to that. That's, decision to have those cubes that we already cut for you so we already have them so uh and i'll show uh, well actually so these are the 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 cubes that we will provide you guys with and uh jeff from the bill lab created this awesome and the factor uh, sorry a pedestal uh that works pretty well in terms of like we just have to screw on top basically the foam cube and then it's it's pretty stable and it's fixed on the on the platform as well on the stage and and, and, we, and then you guys will go from there like this will be your starting point so we will ask you not to move the pedestal just because if it's there for everyone we we can just implement everything faster and uh, yeah so so that's it so these are the real dimensions um of everything let me see and more and we have seen already great submissions from you guys, uh, but I, I wanted anyway to just just to, to give you some information of, uh, I don't know, possibilities on how to, to show, to explain uh, this, this process digitally and how to communicate your intentions uh, in terms of, you know, really visualizing the planes that don't exist <laughs> visually. So it's something that you will manage only through the Rhino Grasshopper. And that's a good way just, just to show uh, really where the robot is going, uh, what's, what's the expected result. And even the sequence, because the sequence matters uh, in terms of, you know, like when you cut one piece, it's not there anymore, right? So like in that, that from that, and then you go from there. So you really have to imagine. The, the, the importance of the, the sequence of the cuts. You can create how many <laughs> cut planes as you want. It could be even be a line, as I showed earlier with, the, with that example of the topography and just that line cutting uh, really on top, <clears throat> on top of the cube. Usually, um, so if you are accurate and we are accurate in the fabrication process, we could call this process stereotomy or like a version of this because it's not really subtractive because potentially when you use the hot wire cutter 
in the middle of the material, in this case, like in the middle of the foam cube, you can just have two pieces and recombine them. So this notion is not necessarily subtractive because like when you, when you meal, the material is gone basically, right? Like you're kind of like finding the form inside the material. In this case, you can really have, imagine like the two sides of your process. So like not necessarily is what you're topping out and what's left, but it could be a really a combination of the two parts that can have opportunities in terms of really creating uh, two, two, two elements that uh, are have a relationship. And what's great is that since we're cutting it with the wire, the tolerances are more or less still in place for them to almost function as a puzzle piece or just the way they come together without having to worry about uh, uh, them not being accurate enough because they're cut from the same, essentially the same block. Exactly. And that's a good point, actually, because, you know, when we were testing the hot wire cutter in the beginning, we really had to, to balance the speed of the robot as well, because like if you go very slow, then you are like melting more material, basically. And like it really needs it, it's super interesting to understand really like the process, but also the material that you're working on. And then you have to balance the, the tool path and the speed and where the robot is going just to manage that tolerance that Misery was talking about. Uh, more examples, more uh, representation, even of like sort of like all the process, like the complexity of the process converging in one point and like the process sort of exploded in phases. And again, like to see, to see the sequence, what happens, what's left and how you want to operate with the, the, the form that you have, for instance, in this stage at this point of the, the, the fabrication streamline. More of this, not necessarily you need to work with straight planes. You can work with curves as well. Uh, if you are, if you try to visualize this, you might see just a curved plane here and then the, the robot will, will follow that information because we will guide basically the center point of the wire. So that the, that big element uh, is, is holding uh, the hot wire and then the center point will be what interests us in terms of addressing it toward target points. So we will create targets in space. I don't know how many slides I have. So we will create points in space and this will be the leading the leading element that will allow us to achieve those points. More, more examples. So that's the some documentation from this past semester. Uh, this, uh, yeah, I should have included the some photos with the hands as well, so you had a sense of like the scale of proportions of these objects. And then uh, we won't have time in this context to, to develop this kind of form finding, but we used um, during the course at COED, we used also this process to create form works uh, to, to work with plaster. Uh, so like to have a secondary element, a secondary material uh, that could be uh, just, just deployed in terms of uh, customization of production. And in that case, it's interesting to see, like, if you were to, to develop a model this big with 3D printing would take so long, right? While instead with the robot and even with the previous example that I showed, it's just really about like designing a line and so the robot can follow it. And so like in this case, you have you, you, you really have like specific instructions, information and possibilities based on what you want to produce to deploy your and to, to realize uh, your architectural idea. So here are some pictures of the, the models that were created by the students using, and in this case we used, um, uh, we cut the, the, the foam cube from two perpendicular directions. And, uh, and then we used, we played with the positive and the negative spaces uh, to create these forms. And as you can see, an, a notion of scale uh, as well that comes into that. So I think we are perfectly aligned because I see Matthias Del Campo joining us now and we just got to the end of the presentation. <laughs> nice to meet you, by the way. <laughs> it's great, thanks for your time.
absolutely. Uh, since this was super well timed, I, I think I should also sort of introduce uh, the Matthias Del Campo. <laughs> but uh, so uh, Dr. Matthias is an architect, designer, educator, and I don't know if I'm missing out a few other uh, professions, Matthias, please uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, and he's uh, an associate professor at Taubman College University of Michigan. Uh, and uh, also the founder of uh, SPAN with uh, partner uh, Sandra Meninger. Uh, in addition to that, he's also the director of uh, the Architecture and uh, Artificial Intelligence Lab at the University of Michigan. Uh, so I guess at this point, I'll just leave the stage to Matthias and uh, have him sort of share his insights, trajectories, potentials, and, and projects. So. Um, all, all the students, please help me in welcoming Matthias. Thank you for doing this, by the way, at, at such short notice. We're happy to host you. No, I'm happy to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so this is going to be just a 15 minute rush through some of the things that we have been working on with the practice, with the lab, some ideas and thoughts and, and, and also some fundamentals about AI and in general. So to give you just a little taste uh, of what we're doing, this would be normally like about an hour lecture. Um, but um, I hope that uh, I hope that I can pique your interest, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so there we go. So this, this lecture is called Neural Architecture. And, and basically, as I said, it's like a summary uh, of several things here. And basically it's called Neural Architecture because I've been trying to develop a more general idea around AI and architecture. And uh, I borrowed the term neural from the arts uh, and music because there is already a field there that is called neural art. And there's a field called neural music. And I thought, well, why don't we borrow that for architecture too? We have fared fairly well as architects when we borrow things from the arts. So I thought maybe that's a good way to go. So my whole journey in terms of interrogating AI um, started back in Vienna, where there is the OFI, the Institute for Artificial Intelligence that was founded in the late 60s. Or let me put it this way, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a descendant of a laboratory that was founded in the 60s. And, Sandra was so uh, had, co had connections to this laboratory, especially to Dr. Arthur Flexer, who you see here on the top left, who at the time was a student and an expert in neural networks. And uh, you know, he's known for working for the music retriever group, which basically created the foundation for all the software that you know that recognizes music. And he basically um, taught us in the fundamentals of neural networks and what they do and how they operate. And at the time when we were having these conversations, they had, read, they had successfully simulated one neuron to one neuron. So there was a big news back then. Um, you can imagine that with that uh, technical framework, it was not really possible to do much work in terms of architecture. It started to gain steam in the last three, four years through our collaboration with Michigan Robotics and Computer Science, who we have the luck to, uh, to develop with them together several ideas and techniques in terms of designing with neural networks um, and AI in general and architecture. So artificial intelligence is deeply embedded in our everyday life, right? Neural networks help diagnose medical cases, make decisions on bank loans, decide parole cases, read your bank checks, filter job applications, drive cars, fly drones, detect fraud, translate text online, and recommend to you which book to read next. They are part of our households in the form of quasi-intelligent thermostats and security systems, help finding our way in our cars by using adaptive maps and are close to the human body in the shape of smartphones and watches. To estimate your health status, for example, they recognize your face and the way you type and help you photograph like a pro. Among many other things, the data generated by all these activities aid in perfecting the training of all these algorithms. In other words, AI is everywhere. And these are only the examples that they currently perceive as humans. The massive underbelly of artificial neural networks providing intelligent services, managing the copious amounts of data on servers, organizing the routes uh, data takes, controlling traffic lights, managing shipping, subway schedules, and many other mundane tasks elude our field of vision. 
They operate, as Lefmanovich put it in his book, AI Aesthetics, and I quote, in the gray every day of the digital society, end of quote. So how does AI basically respond to this, uh, to this universe that just exploded around us and we as architects need to be involved and how can we be involved? Like, first of all, we need to understand a couple of basic things about AI. The difference between generalized AI and applied AI. So generalized AI is an AI that can do a variety of different functions at the same time. Uh, think about data in Star Trek or Agent Smith in the Matrix or the hosts in Westworld, yeah? All those are AIs that, that basically try to emulate what's, what we as humans can do in that we have various sensors, various, in, um, 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 various inputs that tell us about the world and we make decisions based on that. And through all this sort of history, we, we develop consciousness and decision-making abilities. Now, uh, generalized AIs are highly difficult to achieve because of the amount of data necessary really to achieve to, to make that work. So the main research these days in AI is not about generalized AI. It's not about creating a perfect human robot. It's still considered a little bit naive to think that it's actually possible, yeah? What AI is, generally, is used these days, generally speaking, is in the form of applied AIs. Applied AIs are um, contained exercises that are uh, solved with the help of a neural network. For example, facial recognition, um, uh, automated driving so that cars can recognize their environment. They can differentiate between a human, a car, the street, and so on. Um, text recognition, and so on. All these sort of things are compartmentalized uh, problems that are getting solved using an applied AI. And that's pretty much also what we are doing currently in architecture. Maybe a little bit about machine learning. So machine learning is a part of applied AI in this field of tools set of, or models that we currently use in designing and construction uh, of the built environment. So how can this be used in architecture? Um, I will show you two examples about how this is currently being used, or let's, let's put it like the, the, the starting of how this is getting used. This is an example from the research of the Technical University in Munich uh, which comes from the field of machine vision um, and is so a so-called digital twin. Uh, this machine learning model is being trained to recognize parts of a construction site, like the columns, the scaffolding, and so on. And those parts are connected to a building information model that makes it um, possible to check for quality, for completeness, uh, for the progress of construction. There has been earlier attempts to do this. Um, Gary Technologies, for example, did something similar years ago, uh, but by using um, uh, machine learning, the rate of success of, of, of recognizing pieces is much higher, depending, of course, of the training that you put it through. <clears throat> now, another aspect is uh, the aspect of surveillance. This is an example from uh, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University from 2017. So this is already a little bit older, but it shows how a machine learning um, process is, is, or machine vision process is recognizing individual workers and basically analyzing what they're doing. Yeah, so one is preparing, another is fixing something, another one is you know, maybe hauling material around, but there's one in red here that says rest. And this is actually where I, I urge you for cautiousness in terms of using neural networks um, in, in, in a role as surveillance on the construction side, because it's, I don't think that, that you should stress workers into working faster on the construction side. It's an unsafe environment already. So you should not really push that further, I think. And this also talks about ethics of AI applications in architecture. You really have to be cautious about why and what you're using it for because it's, it very fast goes into the area of surveillance and uh, productivity control and things like that, yeah. And the, this was basically the area of um, expediency, using AIs as a tool to, um, you know, make things faster, uh, better, uh, cheaper, yeah. But there's, of course, also a completely different area where you can use neural networks. And this is one that I'm very invested in, which is as, as a tool to interrogate contemporary culture and how basically it informs architectural, the architecture discipline. Yeah? I've been uh, working with um, 
me just uh, turn off the sound here. So I have a deep interest, for example, in interrogating the history of architecture for, and mining it for possible solutions that we can uh, discover through the use of machine learning. This is not about copying old um, styles or copying old solutions. It's really more about understanding that the combination of all these weird things coming together can, um, this can unveil a possibility to um, personal understanding of what I know of AI. I don't think that AIs per se are creative. What happens is that through their way of reading our data, they spit out images that are estranged, weird, um, defamiliarized. Yeah? And there's a whole philosophical uh, branch discussing that with weird realism. Um, and I'm very interested in that this sort of imagery that they produce the images themselves might not be creative, but we as humans are able to interpret them creatively. Uh, as Vasim said, the, the director and CEO of, of DeepMind, uh, what machines can do really good is interpolate, interpolate between data. What we as humans can do really well is extrapolate from that data. And that extrapolation is the creative process that we as architects apply to problems that we get. Yeah? Artists like um, Sofia Crespo, uh, Mario Klingemann and others are basically opening up that door in, in culture in general. And I think that myself with other colleagues, we are trying to push the boundary of that also in terms of architecture, like Daniel Polochan, Emmanuel Co, several others. Okay. Um, just a very, very brief look under the hood of machine learning. Yeah. So what, how does it, for example, learn anything? It needs tons of data to do that. And I'm gonna give you a quick example of number recognition. Number recognition is widely used in banking. So when you go to a bank and you write a check by hand with your numbers, you can rest assured that no human is ever gonna look at that numbers. It's going to be a machine that is trained to read the numbers. And the more examples of numbers it has, the better it can read your really bad handwriting, yeah? Uh, in banking by now, there are in the millions of examples of numbers. So because of that large amount of, of, of information about numbers, they can make a very informed assessment of what this number is. And what it does is basically divides the image of the number into its RGB values, yeah? And starts to recognize the patterns within those values and the respective number. Of course, it starts with manual training. You have to first give a data set, a labeled data set, where you as a human said, this is a one, this is a zero, this is a three, this is an eight. That's how it starts. But after a while, it can start to learn it on its own once it has enough information about that. And it, it is also, of course, very important to define the problem for an email. For example, if the problem is, you know, recognize an eight, then that eight is, is represented by a specific curve within that uh, data set. Yeah? And we see a data set here, like all those points here are parts of my data set. And the closer my curve is, to those, um, to, 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 to the maximum amount of those examples, the closer we get to recognizing something successfully. Of course, this is not really just a linear two-dimensional thing. Actually, in most cases, it is a multi-dimensional surface or tensor that either needs to go as close as possible to all data points or separates them into classes, yeah? I know, I'm sorry, this is super quickly like the math. Um, I'm, I'm already done, yeah? So I'm just gonna skip over this before it becomes too nerdy. Um, so um, it, for architects, what we can do is create data sets. And the good thing about architecture is that we have about 7,000 years of plans and, and documentation about architecture. Vast amounts of data that are just lying out there. Yeah? And we can harness those to really inform architecture in very particular ways. And it's really dependent on the inventiveness of the person using them, what, they're, what they can do with that. In this case, this was a, this was a thesis project two years ago uh, by uh, Hannah Dogadi, uh, Mariana Moreira de Calvaro, and Iman Suleiman, who created um, uh, uh, 12 different data sets uh, of very specific architectural um, objects, doors, windows, staircases, facades, um, and so on. But what was really interesting 
uh, is um, is the in the middle of the left column. There's a gray data set, and that data set was their own renderings. This is the first time we tried that, and I thought it was really really a, an incredible idea. That instead of just using found data to really create your own data set using your own renderings, because then what happens is that the neural network can start to pick up on your own sensibility as a designer. Yeah. So this is, for example, on the left side, one image from their data set. On the right side, they basically created a, um, a generative adversarial network that was able to read their own sensibility data set, those images of rendered elements they've created, and apply that to an image of a, of a Baroque church. You can, of course, continue doing these sort of things. Um, this year, for example, is a recent um, result of a, of a neural network that we have been training for a while now with our own designs at SPAN. So we use like 10 years of photographs and images, um, renderings, uh, model photographs, and so on, as a data set for a neural network to interpret our own work, yeah? Uh, we didn't change much the weights. We just were curious about what would the neural network do with this? And this is a style gun too, by the way, just to just so you're informed, this is a style gun too. And for me, the, the most surprising part of this is that um, I can recognize certain features and elements and things that appear here. And most particularly, the coloration is very close to what we do in general. Yeah, uh, So it can read those better. I have a longer version of that. I'm not sure if I put this already on my YouTube channel or not, but if you, I, I'm probably going to put it up if you want to see that, the longer version. And this is basically what happens here when you, so this before was a style GAN, this here is a style transfer, what you see here, which operates with two images. And we have been experimenting very naively at the beginning, I have to say, uh, with um, using satellite images of cities and landscapes and see if we can actually generate a, a city on any given landscape. And that worked. And then another one where it was a question, can we basically combine um, our own sensibility as designers with um, urban textures? And this is the result you, you see here. Sorry, I'm rushing a little bit through here. Um, so in, in end effect, this city does not exist, the one that you see here. It is completely the result of that neural style transfer method. Uh, sorry, I have just something passing by here. Let me wait a second. This, this street seems to be like the main emergency lane here in Philadelphia. Like I have this every five minutes. Uh, but anyways, I, so I was here with this image. Um, it was completely, oh, it's another one. Okay, but I hope they're done now. Now you can of course do the same thing with plants. And that's also why we have been doing this workshop here at Digital Futures, where we are looking, where we are looking to collect plants. And um, we we had we, we had some experiments where we tried out what happens with a data set, for example, of Baroque plants. And again, this was more more like a, a test to see if we can get results out of them that can be interpreted successfully as plants, and they can. But in order to move forward, we need to do data sets that are better informed because these data sets do not have any semantic information. And without semantic information, you cannot define what it is. It will just read features and sort of create a new pattern out of it, but it cannot really say, this is a living room, this is a sleeping room and so on. Nonetheless, I really liked experimenting around with these because they, they, we did these combinations between modern and Baroque plans. And the, the idea here was that, um, uh, or let me put it this way, as it was an experiment, we did not know exactly what the result is going to be. But what you can see here is a combination between the voluptuousness, the thicknesses, the pochets of Baroque plans and the asymmetry of a modern plan. And this was a surprising result for us. Again, these are rather used as an inspiration than really a project or a finished project or so. Let me jump over this. Most recently, we had uh, these clients here. These were our customers for a project that we did uh, for the University of Michigan, uh, for their um, for Michigan Robotics, uh, the so-called Robot Garden. And in, in this project, we actually used um, 
the same methods that we have been showing before by collecting a ton of satellite images of various different uh, geological conditions and using those, this data set to hallucinate features onto the site. The results were sometimes good, sometimes better. And it, it needed exactly what I, what I mentioned before, human interpretation to really be able to translate that um, imagery into uh, something that you can build. Yeah? And uh, this was built in late 2019, early 2020. It stopped, of course, because of COVID. Uh, but um, it was finished recently and is being used, as you see, as a testing ground successfully. This is a little view into uh, the data set of uh, satellite images of landscapes, some of the results of uh, hallucinating on the side. And I also like very much the ones that we could not use that created things that were completely unusable as design method. But I think that especially in images like this is where chances lie of finding something really innovative and interesting in architecture. It's not the first time happy accidents were part of computational design throughout the 90s when people didn't really know how to model correctly. Weird things happened and they produced interesting things. I think we're in a similar phase at the moment with this AI uh, research. And um, the Austrian Pavilion for the Dubai Expo in 2020 was, which we did in 2018, was the first time when we used um, style transfer and, and the bump mapping with style transfer to create anything in architecture. So the ceiling was based on that, uh, on that method. Would have been great to build this. I would have loved to see that thing built. That ceiling must have been insane, but maybe another time. A couple of more. And most recently, what we have been really pushing a lot is going from 2D to 3D. Uh, using graphs, graph convolutional neural networks and uh, model data sets. So instead of doing data sets based on images, we're doing data sets based on, on models. Yeah. Uh, some, I'm going to skip to all this kind of stuff, which is way too deep now. But the interesting part is that it, it, the idea was I modeled 1,500 models last summer alone. Yeah? And I had to do them alone because the idea was that it was supposed to pick up on my sensibility as a designer. If anyone else has modeled them, then this doesn't work. So I had to model them myself alone and I had to label them al alone myself, which means if anyone asks me what I did during COVID is I was doing a data set. Um, but the, the, it, it was an interesting exercise because we really were curious, can it pick up on something? I, I mean, would it produce something that I would design? Yeah, and the answer is yes. It was really interesting that this was a successful approach to that. This year, we are moving a, a step further and we're trying basically to, instead of making that an individual design sensibility, to create a, a, a diversified global data set of houses yeah, in order to understand if we can use a diversified large data set of houses, does it generate houses then that are accepted in various cultures, for example. And another approach was using language as a design method. Um, the, the DALI is a very popular version of this. Uh, we actually used a version that was out before DALI called Attentional Neural Network, uh, where we used uh, language as a trigger for design, basically describing, saying like, okay, if this is, um, we, we basically described the different elements of the design, and then it, it provided images, and based on those images, we continued the design. Now, this already shows one of the major problems we have with any of those neural network uh, approaches is that it divides interior from exterior. So you can either do the exterior or you can do the interior, but you cannot do those things in combination that we as architects usually do, which means it forces us to rethink what to do with the problem. And what we are thinking is we, we probably will need to think about really separating, divorcing interior and exterior again. Yeah? Which, which brings us a little bit back to some of those Baroque uh, topics yeah, about interior and exterior appearance of buildings. This is an early thought. We need to continue working on this to make it a little bit, little bit more clear. So this was the result then. So what does it mean if we are being assisted by tools that learn when we move from using expert systems to learning system, when we live with robots and machines, when we extend our senses through an added perception of the world, 
Can these tools extend our creative potentials and will they aid us in representing scientific and mathematical concepts of space? Who will be the curator or advocate of data? The data we acquire and the data we produce. And who will be the participants in the design protocols that we are about to generate? Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for the provocations. I'm sure we have tons of questions, but unfortunately, we're really low on time. But I'm also seeing Matthias every second day. So if we have uh, questions, I'll be sure to uh, answer and we, we could have a quick debate and conversation later. Uh, Matthias, would you have the time to take one question or? Or are we Unfortunately, overtime? I have to I have to rush now, but All right. I, 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 I'll be I sure to, to say, gather them and yeah, redirect. Exactly. Thank towards you. It. All right. Perfect. One thing I want to thanks, say thanks is a lot. this book is coming up in fall, which is far more detailed than anything I said now. Yeah. And also, I can highly recommend um, to uh, sign up for my YouTube channel where like lectures are coming regularly on, uh, online. And there is a ton of tutorials if you're interested in the stuff that we're doing. Right. I hope that thanks. ceiling thanks. works out soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Cool. Bye, I guys. Will see you in a bit. Thank Have you a so great much. Day. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, I guess. Can we say wow? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I. At the same time, I also think we've been catapulted into. Uh, architecture, robotics, machine learning. And just yesterday I was seeing this talk by Daniel Davis where they were trying to harness, at the, at the time, I think this was two years back when he was the director of research at uh, WeWork, where they were essentially trying to gather the data that people were sort of renting out spaces in WeWork just as a business model to understand not just the spaces we design, but also once they're occupied and how they're being used and the kind of revenues they're generating to sort of use all that information to see if the building was successful or not uh, post occupancy. So I guess this is definitely one of the provocations that have been sort of tried and tested by a lot of professionals around the globe. But I'm also curious about what your reactions to these are, um, if any. Or we, you could also take the class to sort of like digest it while we uh, run through or, or like come back to Bianco and run through Rhino and Grasshopper. I think all right, so I we're can... all out of words. Uh, hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you so much, Monsieur, for arranging this. It was really amazing. Like I've been uh, working within this like architecture field, and I always wanted to like you know I've searched for it a lot. That how like the symbolism works, how one thing is like you know, uh, uh, in history, the work that has been done is having some kind of pattern that is repeating. Uh, and AI is a very nice way to represent that. Uh, I'm sure it's gonna take like a lot more time to digest what you've learned, but yeah, it was really amazing. Thank you so much. Absolutely, happy to help. Also at the same time, I'm often, like more often than not, I'm also sort of perplexed by this question of what is our position as a designer? Because then we're also diving into robotics and AI and machine learning, which very, like inherently and intuitively come to data scientists or engineers and we're sort of in between that space where we're trying to learn enough to have a fruitful conversation with each of these uh, disciplines but also sort of go back to us as creatives and and uh, go uh, tap that uh, creative and designer side of it, which by education, we're all trained to be architects, but we're also sort of exploring these things at the periphery. So that 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 more often than not leaves me with this question of how do I explain the work we could be potentially doing to someone who thinks, oh, you're an architect, so you make drawings and you know a lot about concrete and foundation, but there's, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, not not inhibitions, but a lot of uh, self questioning about where the discipline is, or like what the discipline is really going towards. So I don't know if uh, you you share similar thoughts, but uh, yeah, I was just curious about where you think the discipline stands at this point, especially when we're like being bombarded with robotics and 
materials and AI and machine learning. And you're like, wait a second, we were trained to do something else. So we're in a way, we're also self teaching uh, outside of school, right? Because that's, that's uh, uh, well, in a way, the least and most we could be doing right now to sort of be grappling with this uh, new wave that seems to be hitting uh, digital architecture. So computation in a lot of ways moves beyond geometry, but they're still using sort of computation to, to talk more about uh, data and analytics. Yes, I think, uh, I think that the other day, Sara, when she made the first presentation of robotics, uh, one thing that she mentioned on the press is that robots, uh, like architects, uh, we made drawings. We don't make things, you know. And this, all of this of data, is is huge for ourselves because I don't know. Uh, today, architects are are converting to, uh, into uh, programmers and data analysis and all, all of things like that and uh, is huge. I also work with BIM and the, the thing that uh, he showed earlier that is a camera on the job site that looks on on the on the side and look the productivity of each worker is it blow my mind you know because uh, that is how technology can uh, help us to to check on the on the job site and and give that information to the to the beam model yeah yeah i agree with that uh, I guess we should maybe, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, please. No, no, I was just going to say maybe we marinate in this thought for a day and come back to it uh, when we start talking about uh, uh, day five, where we'll primarily be speculating workflows. And, you know, so this is when we really build and really go wild with the possibilities of how this could be potentially roped in. Yeah, and I, want, I wanted to pick on one. One thing that Spartaco said related to we're turning into programmers, I think uh, I might disagree about that simply because uh, the more the technology advances, the more like we have to find ways to control, for instance, as Matthias Del Campos was mentioning, data set, input data, and how to process those things. And at the moment, we are doing that through scripting, like really like with numbers and everything, like depending on the software uh, for AI. Uh, so for this reason, I'm wondering when, when these things will, will turn into an interface for designers. So at that point, it's blurry the relationship between like, you know, like ge geometric design and, and then programming and scripting. Because like, Grasshopper is based on functions and we don't see them. We see the components, we plug them and we understand the meaning of the components. Doesn't produce semantic work because we give meaning to what we are creating uh, and which is the stage of the tools we're working on today. But um, I think that these relationships are embedded in the components. So I'm wondering when, when AI will be combined as well as a tool for, because like the, the, the fact that you don't draw by hand anymore to produce a mm -hmm. floor plan, right? And you do that in Rhino, you give it for granted. It's just obvious, right? But like you don't consider, you, we don't consider ourselves anymore computer right. scientists yeah, for this, that. right? So I think it really depends on when the, when was Grasshopper invented, like uh, created, like when was like 2005, more or 16, less, right? Five? Right. Yes. And so, and we are now in 2021 and it's very like the, the knowledge spread and we know how to use that tool because the interface helped us a lot. So it's, it's really, yeah. what you were saying, like really depends on the infrastructure yeah. and now that will evolve. Uh, and, and also like in parallel with, with the tools of production, I think really we'll see all these things um, coming together. Yes, yeah, Sarah. I, I agree. So uh, my philosophy or my way of thinking that we are 
now designers, but we also are learning to use robots and digital fabrication tools. Uh, the thing is the industry that produces things uh, all is controlled by engineers and programmers and, and people like that, that uh, they are uh, people that not are into the design like us, but- We're getting uh, there, we're getting there. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we are in a line that is in between designer that uh, not, doesn't know how to use technology and uh, the engineers that use technology very, very well. And that line is a passion, you know, is people like us to pursue that, uh, to uh, give technology a design, I think, and fabricate uh, more or less um, things with robots and digital fabrication. So he, uh, this data, uh, analysis and all of this information is the next step to an uh, analyze to bring into the game i think yeah and also as you mentioned is like because we are passionate maybe we are a bit nerd because we want to learn these things and that's why i mentioned the first day that like higher education is part of the digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution because when these things come into higher education then you change the culture of like the, the, the people that you're preparing to be the professionals in the future. So it's like, it's, it's really, really like a big infrastructure of elements coming together. At the same time, it also sort of not bothers me, but makes me inquisitive about <laughs> the state of craftsmanship uh, and, and how to sort of uh, do justice to this knowledge that they've been developing for centuries and through generations to sort of not draw the line, but also to be aware and sort of um, to be adaptive of that situation. Adding to that, uh, that's right. We are moving towards precision right now. Uh, like, and we are moving towards like that much that we are designing in precision with precision. So uh, that's why the battle with art and technology is always, you know, gonna be there. And it's like, you know, you can't choose any. We have to find like somewhere at the middle point where like both things come together. Sarah yeah, was right, wanna... like, when she said like, uh, now we don't draw things with hand because it's moving toward comfort and precision. So that's why like, I also think about these things, but. Now I got an answer. <laughs> Do yes. we keep talking about these things forever now? Yes. Because yes. <laughs> uh, uh, actually the space around me is starting to get crazy because we have reviews at 9 a.m. Uh, so without delaying further, I think we should jump into Rhino Grasshopper and marinate in these thoughts. I want to keep probably... discussing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, okay, we so that's a year right though, is it? Yeah. Okay, let's do this. Exactly. When we talk about customized production, let's go back to this conversation and just, yeah, it's really amusing to me, like to, to hear your thoughts, uh, your point of view, and we might find some, some room to talk about authorship as well and the things that we can and we cannot control over these processes. But yeah, let's spend like 10 minutes <laughs> with the demo so that- Just you so can... you have enough to sort of run with as well for, for your <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So let's start with the easy one. Oh, by the way, Jeff is here. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for the light bright. We said thank you before. Images are awesome. Okay. Uh, okay. So you, uh, I'll go through really briefly to these two scripts. I'm starting from this one only because it's uh, more intuitive just to really see uh, deployed some of the things that I mentioned before, like imagining, you know, like the center point of our tool, but uh, going through uh, like uh, the, the center of some lines that you are designing uh, to visualize the path of the outwire cutter. So as you can see, we have a new tool, this big guy. We have a, 
in the in the bill lab. Um, so in this case, uh, as you can see, created really like a simple geometry to two or three curves um, connected with a loft. And then how this works. So basically what we need to do is to consider like the, the two boundary curves. And we want to, to, control, to control the density of points uh, on the, the curves themselves. Uh, in this case, as you can see, as long as we have many curvatures here on this surface, you, you have an approximation, again, because we have like sort of like this um, rectilinear uh, element that uh, will uh, will address, that you will address um, in the toolpath. Um, and so once we have our points, we want to connect them just really to see where the wire is going. I think it's just it's just an easy way to, to visualize uh, the process. In this case, I had to invert the list uh, only because uh, simply like the, the curve was recorded inversely compared to where the zero is. Uh, so once you have this, you can see really the wire and you can you know, modify the approximation. Uh, let's keep it this way so it's, it's more visible. And given the slides, given this visualization of the toolpath, we need to, to align the, 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 the center point of the, of the end effector with the center points of our lines. And these will become our, our planes. I need, I'll show this, um, just I, I need to invert the tangents only because the robot is going from one direction on the, uh, one, on the other. I'll show the, the simulation in a second, but just so as you see the process. And so our target points will be these guys. And we, 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 we plug uh, the, the, the points into the, the linear common. And if you remember from yesterday, in this case, it's useful to use the Cartesian offset. Uh, in this case, simply uh, along the Z vector so that the robot, when the robot reaches the first target point, it doesn't, you, you don't risk, you know, like to break the material or like to, to, to push it. Um, and, and so the, the sort of the robot is already in the proper position, maybe it's too high. Just I don't want to generate a collision here. It's just really to give the robot the time to, to rotate properly so that it can get to the proper rotation, proper orientation of the tool before Actual, actually like reaching the first target point, right? And you can see, visualize the offset. So when we're there, it will follow, right? And so that you can see the visualization. So that's the process. And in this case, if I disregard this connection, let's unplug it. Simply like, I really need to, to change the orientation of the plane. That's the reason uh, why you're seeing uh, this negative input here, right? It's like the same. And by the way, uh, I didn't forget about your questions. <clears throat> your question yesterday, uh, we will see tomorrow uh, uh, to while talking about Customized tools. We will talk more about, uh, you know, like the, the tools and how to install them with each pendant and then how to understand better these rotations. But like for instance, let's look at what happens, right? When when we're working in a default mode, uh, we'll talk more about this uh, tomorrow. I'm trying to create an end effector that has arrows and you can you can really visualize what it means to rotate the settings. And you remember the rotation is this one. So basically you're addressing down the, the tool. So I have really few minutes to jump into the other one, but that's the strategy. And, and really uh, let's go interrupt me if you have questions, of course, actually let's get this bigger. 
So this is the, the actual, the, the real condition in the build lab. So you will see the model of the pedestal, you'll see the foam cube. Uh, so I had the confirmation that it's six by six by six inches object. And feel free to cut it <laughs> however you want, either like if you want to work inside the material or you want to, to create, just to work on the pattern on top or you want to, to cut away some parts. And to do this, and that's the base file, you can decide whether or not you, you want to use this design, the, um, this design approach. But basically, the idea is to have, uh, let's see if I find the starting point, right? We have the realization here, the, the creation of a cube with the dimensions that we will need for our exercise. And then basically, actually, let me zoom into that. All right, we have this point and in, for this specific file, what we have done was to create basically a distribution. I don't know why it's not zooming, give me that as a, yeah, maybe in here it's easier to see that. So basically we, we have randomized uh, the creation of points that are revolving around our origin, uh, so to speak, of our, uh, of our cube. And by using some random components within a range, uh, check this out, it's just, you know, just geometry and you can have, you can create uh, some, some variation. So the geometry relationship is just to have in origin a vector that is reaching those points revolving around the origin and then creating a plane here, right? So once you have the plane, basically you can you can construct the visualization of the cut plane. So it's just visualization is to see how uh, how we, we can cut this form. And you can play also as the rotation went from zero to 360, but you can also like work on this, uh, where the domains start and end, just in terms of how much material you wanna cut off of this cube is really, is like regulating um the, the the cut elements in a way that you're not uh you know like you're you're not reaching the pedestal so like i tried to to build the domain so that uh this part won't, won't be an issue in terms of in terms of collisions if that makes sense um just check it out. So whatever, so what you're seeing here is just visualization. So like the elements that are happening here all together are basically exploded in sequences. And so you can see like the cube with the first cut plane and then the result visualized, but also in parallel with the second cut plane. So I was thinking just that it's easier to see like once you have the first sequence, what happens in the moment in which you are adding like a second operation and 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 we go on like this so on and so forth so we go and then we get uh that's the last last part with the last cut plane and in this example i said six but you can have you can reduce the number you can increase the number it's really up to you uh, as long as like the easiest thing for the build lab would be to have the sequence all in one file. That's just, if that's possible, works best for us. Um, and then again, explore that you can go through these, but these are the elements, so the, 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 the initial cube and the, 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 sorry, the cube and the cut planes. So that at the end, you can, you can see also the results uh, when you change, you know, the details here. Um, again, not necessarily you have to push this, this, but it's just a starting point and you can try this um, and try to see also like to test your script as well. So what happens in this case? Let's start with, this, with the first one. It's basically the same approach of what I've showed a second ago. So we have the two lines of the plane, the cut plane, you can decide either like if you want these two guys or the perpendicular ones, depending really on how you are seeing the robot going through the geometry. It's like the, 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 the toolpath that for you is more logic. We break 
these lines into points, we, we visualize really the, the toolpath, the hot wire cutting uh, cutter like going, going through this. We want to find the center point uh, uh, with the, the length is 0.5. So we have the center. Same thing about the negative result here. It means that we, when we build the, 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 the target planes, we need to take into consideration also the orientation of the three axes of the center point of the end effector. You can look at where the points are, where the zero. So in this case, you know, slightly bigger that the zero is down here so that the robot will start here, the process and go up. So what we need to do is to plug this into the linear movement. I plug that into the, the offset component as well. And this, yeah, thanks. Okay, I'm now moving there that so that we can just go into the merge and every plane has its own, its own definition. So at the end you can merge them and you can plug them into the, the Kuka PRC command. I could even, but if I kill them here, does it work? Can I just disconnect them? Let's do this. Okay. Let's zoom out a bit. And well, you have the robot reaching the first offsetted target point, going down, reaching the, the first target point, and then retracting, and coming back. And I set as uh, the last the last point in the analysis. Let me grab it from the other screen. Is the last uh, the last program point is where the robot will stop. If we plug the others, the the approaches doesn't the approach doesn't change. Yeah, I should have done the part of the script before. Come back to life. Okay. So in this case, exactly the same thing, but we need some rotations. And I'm telling you that uh, I know that you have super skills, but basically this this group will solve like 90% of your rotation issues in this specific file. Um, if if you want to, to work on this, uh, but basically in this case we have this other plane. We have the two curves breaking down. We find we have to reverse one list uh, just, just to align the points in the proper way. Once we have the center point, we need, uh, let's unplug this for a second. It might take a second. Here we go. So let's see what happens now. So same strategy, linear movement, Cartesian offset. In this case, you have to be, be careful here to manage you know, the X, Y, and Z, because in this case, we are working in the space. You might really want to, you know, to decide, sorry, it's gonna be slow. You have to work in the 3D space to understand where these target points, offset points are. It's very slow, the, the, the script. But basically what's going on here is that so the first move is this one. And then the second, we don't really want the robot to be rotating this way, but we want the end effector to face up. So this is just more natural as a motion, as a movement. So in this case, what we need to rotate is basically we are, let's read this, rotating this vector uh, um, using, um, sort of uh, around the y axis and we need to input degrees here as a rotation. So once we have this, and basically we need to rotate the y axis is our, is our input here, considering like as a reference, the z vector, the z direction. So once we have it, let's put it to zero and I can show you here what's going on, right? You have, I'm sorry about how slow it goes. But basically with this, uh, it's very lagged, but you have the possibility to rotate the orientation of the planes that you will reach with the end effector. 
And so in this case, you see the robot getting to that point with a more natural uh, sort of um, orientation. So in this case, we go from zero. And if we merge the movements, you have everything happening in one file, right? Here we go. So that's the, that's the intention. Uh, there's, there's another plane works in the same way. Uh, take a look at this rotation, try really to plug it to see what happens and you will see the, the results here in terms of the orientation and where the X, Y, and Z of the, these planes are. We might, let's see, if I move these planes, um, everything is locked. But one thing that we did was to uh, detect the collisions. Uh, specifically, we plugged some collisions geometries that's what I have. I have only this one. Ah, the floor. Ah, the floor is down there. Okay. So basically, whenever the the robot will reach will reach one of those two geometries, the Kuka PRC component, the core component, will turn red. And let's uh, cut planes. How do these guys? Is it doing it? Right. So in this case, there's, uh, oh, well, this is a reachability problem, but let's see what happens. So in here, for instance, you see we are touching the collision geometry and the, the, the core will turn red. So be careful uh, in terms of like while you are checking the hiccups or singularities, uh, we have to add this element of complexity as well, which is the, the collision in the real world. And like as in, ter in terms of semantics, just because Matthias mentioned that before, uh, the robot doesn't know what these things are, it just detects these geometries as collision points uh, and, and the stage as well down there. Uh, so we just record this one, one thing, and I, I think that now the file will detect that, but be careful when you have the specifically, let's see, I showed that before. Let's let's plug this as well. There's one rotation that you should be very careful about while checking the file, which is this one. So please, really. Uh, so I think that the robot should turn red uh, based on um, so, some tests that I've done. But please, please be careful. Like when you have this rotation it's very likely that this corner will hit this arm of the robot. So just visualize that, go through this few times before exporting the script. And that's the element that slows down a bit our implementation process in the build lab. So because we are dealing with materials, be more careful, uh, just help us out. I will check your files as well. And uh, Jeff and I, mean, I think we'll do another pass. So I, everything will run smoothly, but yeah, help us just uh, checking the things before submitting them. And as usual, uh, you, can, you can export your script from here, give it a proper name with no numbers or symbols, apply, and then you have the script. Sorry, I rushed a bit, but do you think it's clear, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Also, uh, just in the way we see the planes right there, uh, this could also very well be something like that if this was a curve instead. So I guess the drawing isn't doing justice, but if you were to sort of look at it in a section, we're doing the exact same thing where we, uh, in a way, sort of divide the same sort of curves into smaller points right there, and which are merged. And they follow the same sort of logic of how the plane becomes uh, a surface, but also in another sort of axis. So. Uh, yeah, uh, it's the same logic, but you could also use this geometry to sort of Boolean out uh, from your uh, cubes in the exact same way. Exactly. So again, you can, oh, Jeff, go ahead. If I could mention a couple of common things that we've seen in the past, uh, Sarah mentioned one of them, which is the the corners of the, the bow, I'm gonna call it, uh, coming into contact with the robot. It doesn't, um, 
trigger the same kind of visual warning. So you need to go through the simulation slider like she's doing right now uh, very, very carefully, especially as the, the bow is kind of rotating uh, between cuts um, from one, moving from one plane to the next. And very similarly, um, another uh, unwanted outcome is also when the, the bow is moving between cuts, there is often a twisting motion that um, the bow, like the, the firm part of the hot wire, um, is clear of the, the block of foam, but the wire itself will pass through the foam. Uh, so that, and in which case you, you get these really interesting sort of spirally cuts, <laughs> um, but they were not part of the design. So those are the two things that I would encourage everyone to pay very, very close attention to um, as you're proofing the code. I'm trying to push the Z uh, offsets out, up. Oh, is this, this what is... you're talking about? Okay. Let's see. I mean, this case is just not, oh, there might be a, a collision there as well, though. I oh, don't know, no, that's just a rotation. I was trying, so like in case you, you will really realize that there are moments in which uh, you really have, just go very slow get this slider bigger and, and try to visualize uh, moments in which you think that my collisions might happen. And things might not run smoothly. Yeah, a lot of stuff happens in the travel motion uh, between, between planes. That's really, I think, where you need to uh, pay very, very yes. close attention to it. Someone mentioned uh, craft in the digital context. This is where it's at. Hey, Frank, okay. Are you in London or are you in New York? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Also, I mean, uh, the, the cubes and the sizes work really oh, well yeah. with oh, uh, sort of accommodating our cube in just the scale dimensions of, oops, uh, right there. Uh, but it's good to sort of keep an eye out for our six inches sort of being well accommodated within the frame of the wire cutter. All right, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Is that good? Can we have a thumbs Thank up if you guys are following it? Um, Thank you. Okay. okay. Really uh, so you will see the the models uh, tomorrow. Uh, Jeff and Emily will work on your scripts. So please submit everything the Rhino and Graph software so that we can take a look at those yeah. and. Yeah, we'll do our best just to uh, to produce your your material and to to produce your models. I think hopefully this this part will get you guys excited just in terms of like being able like really to do stuff, right? And to to design to design and then to learn to making as well. Yeah, for sure. And and all of the graphics are more or less in place anyways. I guess I, we just continue representing it just the way we've been doing so far. Do we? So I think that Misery, you're you're busy. Uh, yeah. Uh, like are you starting like starting from <laughs> so I should jump out, but uh, yeah, please let us know if you have more questions. Absolutely. And Thank thanks, you. thanks to everyone. Thanks to Jeff mm -hmm. and I'm to attend. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for your submissions. They were great. We're looking forward to seeing uh, the, the next next assignment. Uh, the, the work that you will uh, create uh, for this session. And then tomorrow we'll talk about, we'll, we'll speculate on robotics and customized production. So thanks, thanks a lot for everyone. To everyone, I'll, I'll stop the recording yeah, no now. No, no problem at all.